So in this fifth part of our video lectures on the publishing cycle and peer review, um, I want to talk with you about and review with you ways to address peer review feedback. And I will actually do two videos here, one talking through the sort of an approach to do that and then show you an example from a colleague of mine um, from some of his peer review feedback practice that I think demonstrates some of the things I try to illustrate. So there's two, uh, there's 5A and 5B here um, for this for this fifth part on addressing peer review feedback. But one thing I wanted to add before I continue that I think I forgot to add in the earlier video, uh, earlier video on four, uh, number four on the peer review is when you submit an article, you've written a manuscript, make sure you only submit it to one journal at a time. That is a very, very important practice that academic and scholarly writers adhere to, you know, as much as possible. Um, if you don't do that, if you submit your article, your manuscript to two or three different journals at the time, you might actually end up having the same reviewers. And those reviewers, you know, will let their editors know like, hey, listen, I got this. I got the same manuscript from Journal X to review as well. And that can often mean an immediate rejection a desk rejection by the editor, even without the peer reviewers going any further. I've heard of cases like this. Um, it is just something that, you know, we that we don't practice. Would it make sense to submit to several journals at a time so you can move up this, the, the process, the speed of peer review? In a way, yes. However, um, journals are very particular. They want to consider your work before somebody else sees it. And so it doesn't, you know, let's say you get accepted by th the three different journals. Um, that kind of sense of competition, I don't think uh, journal editors really welcome. So be cautious of that. And especially and if you publish yourself and or if you're working with others who publish, that is a big piece of advice that I sometimes see novice, novice writers not adhere to and they can get really burned with that. All right, addressing peer review feedback. Let's do this. I want to share this quote, uh, this tweet from Martin van Smeden, who is a statistician at the University of Utrecht in the Netherlands. And uh, this is his uh, sarcastic take on a typical phrasing that many of us use in, uh, our, in, in our comments back to our peer reviewers. We thank the reviewer for suggesting us to write an unrelated paper that addresses their own interests. Because often we have peer reviewers, sometimes you're like, did they even read my paper? Like, what are they suggesting? Like, this has nothing to do with my work. Doesn't happen frequently, but it does happen. And it's because sometimes people just, you know, come from their own perspectives. This can often ha also happen when you're writing, let's say you're writing about uh, maybe historically marginalized populations. I've seen this a lot with colleagues of mine who work in either African-American studies or in indigenous studies, and they submit papers on their uh, on their on their areas of 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 uh, special of their areas of research to mainstream journals, you can sometimes get some really curious feedback from folks who are not really the reviewers might have not might not have a very deep understanding of indigenous studies or of African American studies. So that's uh, so saying this very uh, <laughs> politically correct or very diplomatically here. Um, but but at, but at times you know so that you have to kind of deal with it. Um, and so sometimes, again, reviewers make some really bizarre suggestions, which is like, OK, this is not the paper I'm writing, but thanks. Or they you could clearly say, like, I think this person is really invested in, you know, X, Y and X topic because that's all they're writing about. But this topic is tangential, at, at, you know, at most to my work. So, you know, that, those, that I think prompted this sarcastic, uh, <laughs> sarcastic comment. But what is interesting about this is why I like showing this, the rhetorical move or the kind of the, the phrasing here, we thank the reviewer for suggesting X, Y, Z. That is a very common and sort of foolproof way to start responses to reviewers. We'll see this later um, in, some, in, in, the, in the 5B in the second uh, part of this video where I review some of the example of a colleague of mine. All right, how to respond to peer feedback, right? There is a certain strategy uh, or there's a certain um, categorization or hierarchy of, of ways that you will receive or that editors will communicate you in terms of like, this is what we want to do with your paper. So you have to understand, make sure you understand the verdict you're getting. It's not and different journals, different editors use different language for it, but there is the what, what I like to call the hard rejection where the journal said, and this is different from a desk rejection. Desk rejection doesn't even get sent out to peer review. 
Here you get peer review back. You get feedback from at least two reviewers, as well as maybe additional feedback from a from an editor or editors. Um, but it basically means, hey, um, we decline publishing the manuscript. Thanks for submitting it. Uh, we send it to peer review. Here's the feedback, but don't resubmit. We're not interested, right? And that is a really challenging verdict to deal with emotionally. So, um, and and I think there's there's a big emotional part to publishing and and working with peer review it is because it, it is usually in in written you know it's written feedback we don't know the tone of the writers i've gotten some peer feedback where i thought oh my god these people hated my work um and my initial reaction was like oh my god this is terrible and then I actually and, and it was it wasn't even a hard rejection it was actually a you know they actually were interested in publishing it but the the feedback was just like oh my god i felt like they were slashing me left and right but when I, after a couple of days, sort of had my emotional moments and took care of licked my wounds, I went back and I thought, you know, some of this feedback actually makes sense. So there is an emotional component that um, that we have, and that is a natural and normal reaction. We just need to kind of push through that. And again, heart rejections are very common. Highly successful, published, funded people by sorts of, I mean, you know, the super top stars in your fields, in our fields, have heart rejections all the time as well. So it happens all the time, especially in high impact journals, you know, Nature and Science publish, what, 5% of all the submissions. So, right, it's, it's a reality that, um, especially if you go for high impact journals, um, the chances of heart rejections increase dramatically. Then there is what we call soft rejection. And that is where the journal will consider a revised version that addresses the peer feedback. Just FYI, if you hear the crazy noise in the background, my cat is going nuts right now. I don't know what's wrong with him, and I can't put him in his in a different room because it's even worse. So apologies for that. Hopefully, I'm having I'm wearing um AirPods. Hopefully, it doesn't pick up the sound as much. But in case it does, uh, I listen to it later, and <laughs> we'll see if I have to re-record. Anyways, a soft rejection is where the journal will consider a revised version that addresses the peer feedback. And the peer feedback will guide your revision. Publication is possible, but not guaranteed. This is great. Soft rejections, I, I live for soft rejections. And that is a, a common, you know, common serving um, for scholars. This is what many of us deal with a lot. We're like, hey, this sounds interesting. Here's some feedback. And what usually happens is you can then choose if you want to revise and resubmit. That's always your choice. Always your choice. But if you're like, okay, these comments make sense, I can address them in the time frame given. Sometimes you get two to four weeks, six weeks for um, for revisions. Two months is the longest I've seen um, and heard of. Usually something like a few weeks. And um, and you can negotiate at times with that as well, depending on where you are in your life. But that's the reality. It's happened. You know, you might wait for months to get the feedback, but then they want it back in like three to four weeks. <laughs> uh, so is the, is the nature of our game here. So if you decide to do this, um, uh, if you, you know, again, you're the one, you're the one driving this decision or you and your team, if you want to revise it, um, it will usually, the, your revised version ideally will go out to the same two or sometimes three, let's say two peer reviewers who will then review like, okay, yeah, that makes sense. They've addressed the comments sufficiently. Um, this version is definitely better. Let's uh, and they might say the, they will. They might say the editor, yes, let's publish it. Or the editor might even say. Usually, the editor will send it back to the peer reviewers. Editor wouldn't make a decision on their own, but also depends on the journal and the editor. Some, you know, there's no hard and fast rules. But tradition, you know, most cases it gets sent out. Sometimes those two peer reviewers who reviewed your work initially might not be available, so it might get sent back to others which can complicate the issue because then these others might have some additional comments and thoughts that you then have to address in a second round of revision. So this first round of revision, of revision might not be your only round of revision, but in many cases it is. And if there's a second round, it, it's, it most likely will not be as extensive as the first round of revision. Okay, just be aware of that. I mean, I've heard of cases, never happened to me. I don't ever had more than one round of revision if I got a soft rejection or soft acceptance, which is the next category I'll talk about. Um, but um, I know of colleagues where they went to like four, five, six rounds of revision. They really wanted to publish in this journal, so they stuck with it. I would have probably been like, you know what, thanks. Because um, sometimes even if it gets sent out to the same two reviewers who originally, 
the original reviewers of your manuscript, they might then have additional thoughts, right? That's how we how we academics work. We always have additional suggestions for others. And I'm sure you relate to this based on the feedback I give you on your work, right? That's what we do. So heart rejection, and I forgot to mention this, it's in the in the on the slide there. Heart rejections, how much, how, however much they might hurt or feel uncomfortable. They're still useful because you still get good feedback, right? So keep that in mind as well. And then there's a third ca third category, soft acceptance, I just mentioned. Similar to soft rejection, but the publication is more probable. Um, and journal and the editor usually communicates like, hey, um, we'll consider a revised version. And, uh, you know, and we'll, if you revise this according to these, um, we definitely we will most likely definitely publish it. So again, the wording sometimes might be different, but the soft acceptance is... I mean, that is the, the, that's liquid gold, right? Liquid gold right there, if you're into gold. Well, it's really, it's really very precious. It's what we, what we all want, soft acceptance. Very rarely do you get um, uh, an editor or peer reviewer saying, this is good as is, let's publish or some minor changes. It happened to me once, but actually one of my first articles back in my American studies uh, uh, part of my career. Um, but it, this, it, was a, it, it was a special issue of a, of a journal from the National uh, Ethnic Studies Association. I was a student rep, I was a grad student at the time. I hadn't received my PhD yet, a couple, you know, year or so before I did, I think, or two. And um, and they and they wanted, uh, I was part of a conference panel and they wanted the entire, they wanted to publish the conference panel contributions as a special issue of their journal. So, right, so, and then we submitted our work. So it was in a way solicited and asked for so that's, I think, why the review process wasn't nearly as stringent, because they were very interested in this topic, um, and they have already heard our work uh, at a conference. And by they, I mean the editors and the reviewers who actually, the reviewers who reviewed our work were in the audience. So those are the three, um, uh, three verdicts that we are most often deal with. Again, most importantly, you and the driver's seat and will determine the next steps, right? So nobody else will. You and your team do Another important thing is to organize reviewer comments and pick your battles. You may, you're asked to make multiple changes, some easy, some difficult, some you disagree with, some of whom are probably, you know, can be a professional at times. Those happen too often when they happen. Um, you know, I would reach out to editors and colleagues and how to deal with that. But let's say the comments were all, you know, above par, just that some you might not agree with or disagree with. So Adam, Professor Pouchet, my colleague here at UMB, provides these suggestions, and I really like a systematic approach. There are these comments that request clarification, additional detail, like, hey, can you say more about this? And this should look, might look familiar because that's what I usually do in a lot of <laughs> feedback that I give to writers, right? Do all of these, they're easy, um, right? And, you know, provide additional detail or clarify it. In most cases, your paper will probably actually become stronger because of it. That's been my experience when I, you know, on the writer's side. Um, there's requests to reanalyze or reinterpret existing findings, right? It's a little bit more than just clarifying additional detail. Even if you disagree, do them and respond to them for sure, and even do them as much as possible. They're probably quick to do, right? And then there is the third one, and these increase in level of work on part of the writer or your team, um, requests for additional experiments. Um, so... If you can do that, if it's possible, and this is mostly related to lab-based work, um, consider the time to value ratio. You can respectfully disagree. All you need to do is just make sure you 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 know you provide an explanation why you're not why you're not making the change, um, or something like, hey, this is a great idea um, to do this. However, based on the scope in our paper, we're not you know we're able to do. Uh, but for future work, we we'll consider this right, and we we added a, a line in our um, discussion section on direction for future work, thank you for the suggestion, right? That's one way to address it. I have done this in the past, so this is why it's so familiar to me. And then there's requests you cannot reasonably do. Um, it's not possible. You can say something like excellent idea, but beyond the scope of the study, just like I basically did, right? So ideally you want to re request, you want to meet about 50 to 75% of the requests. So pick the ones which you decline carefully. And, and video, say the second part of this fifth section on um, uh, responding to peer reviews 5b will provide you some examples that we're going to look at together.